Okay, well, let's get started. So thank you very much uh, to everyone for joining. Um, so my name is Becca, and I'm the program director here at MSEF. Um, we're really excited to have this opportunity this year to uh, engage with all of you and celebrate the accomplishments of the Massachusetts Science and Engineering Fair participation this year. Um, we realize it's, you know, it's so unfortunate we can't be in person again this year. And so being able to connect outside of just the judging at the fair is, is so important. So glad you've been able to join. Um, and we really are appreciative of the four alumni here today who have agreed to um, talk about their work and their experience as um, previous MSEF participants. So we're going to go around and do some introductions, um, and then we can get into some questions. Um, there is the ability to put some um, notes if you have questions as we go in the Q&A, and we'll, we should have time at the end to get to that. So don't hesitate to ask any questions you might have um, for the panelists in general or for anyone specifically. Um, and then later today um, at the symposium, there are some more focused talks um, where you can hear from some of these folks again about their research specifically. So there will be that opportunity. Um, while you are virtually here with us today too, um, please check out in, in the exhibit hall, we have a few of our sponsors and partners who have materials that you can look at, um, the poster hall, some, some of you students have uploaded materials that you shared at the fair. Um, the info desk, you can get more information and ask any questions of the tech support that you might need. Um, you can find the agenda there as well. Um, and then in the lounge, we have a few resources that you can explore. Um, we do have an MSEF store that will be opening where you can um, order t-shirts or sweatshirts or anything like that with our new brand um, materials. There's also um, a t-shirt contest if you're interested in designing either a funny science t-shirt or an inspirational science t-shirt. There's a contest for that that you can enter um, as well as one other thing, and I'm forgetting what's in there, <laughs> but I'll remember later, uh, but check it out um, and let us know. Oh, for um, if you want to volunteer, um, there's an application for virtual summer internships with MSEF as well. Um, last year, we had students who did a data analysis project. We had students who did some podcasts, some interviews with alumni, um, and some uh, creating materials for students um, participating in the fair. So check that out. Um, and I think that's it for now. So um, let's get started. Um, so we're going to go around and just do some introductions. So uh, Ethan Whitman, I'm going to start with you. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll just give a little bit of info about myself. My name is Ethan. Um, I participated in MSEF in 2012 and 2013. Um, <clears throat> My projects were in organic chemistry, which is like very different from what I do now, but very generally um, they were aimed at trying to find uh, more environmentally friendly and more uh, and basically safer ways of conducting um, certain reactions and processes that are commonly used in industrial chemistry. Um, after high school, I went to Tufts University for undergrad. And when I was there, I became really interested in psychology. Um, and I worked in a lab there studying um, brain function in combat veterans with PTSD, um, essentially trying to figure out what aspects of brain function might predispose people to developing PTSD after experiencing a traumatic event. Um, I got very interested in neuroimaging and neuroscience and after college went on to work at the National Institute of Health, uh, where I continued with neuroimaging and also began to um, work with genetics as well. And I studied um, sex chromosome aneuploidy disorders, in particular Klinefelter syndrome uh, and trisomy X and worked with um, kids that have these disorders and studied how these um, basically abnormal numbers of sex chromosomes may be affecting brain function and how that may predispose these people to um, autism spectrum disorder uh, or ADHD or other mental uh, disorders. Um, after that, I moved on to Duke uh, where I have begun my PhD in clinical psychology um, now I'm still working with uh, brain function and neuroimaging, 
um, but studying uh, longitudinal change in brain function that occurs in midlife and how changes in the brain uh, around age 45 and age 50 uh, might be able to predict um, individuals who go on to ultimately develop Alzheimer's disease or who just go on to age more rapidly compared to um, other people in the same age. Um, so that's essentially um, a, a little bio about me. Um, yeah, looking forward to hearing from the other panelists and uh, answering any questions. Great, thank you. Um, and as someone in that 45 to 50 age range, I'm a little nervous, but um, <laughs> Jose Zepeda, um, can you give a little intro yourself? Um, yeah, so uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Jose Zepeda. I'm a second year pharmacology student at the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Um, I graduated from Chelsea High School in 2014. Um, so as many of you may know, Chelsea High School is in Chelsea, Massachusetts, and I was able to participate in MSEF in physics and electronics in 2014. Um, my project was focused on the mechanics of double pendulums. Um, so double pendulums are these really cool systems that are both simple, but still uh, display this very dynamic behavior. Um, they have various different interesting properties that uh, we tried to um, capture um, and describe uh, within um, our uh, science fair project. Um, I then went on to study uh, biochemistry at UMass Boston. Um, now, I was uh, double majoring in physics, actually, um, but decided to drop that physics major and focus on biochemistry. It just became too much to handle all of the hardest biology, chemistry, physics, and maths courses all at once. Um, so I stuck with biochemistry, and while uh, in undergrad, I became very, really interested in molecular neuroscience. And uh, so during my under time uh, at my undergrad institution, I was able to work in the SIR lab at MIT, where I was able to study synaptic plasticity, which is uh, the brain's ability to make, break, strengthen, and weaken uh, neuronal connections. Um, and so uh, through our studies, we were able to reveal some of the fundamental processes of brain rewiring um, in uh, live animals. Um, I'm now a National Science Foundation graduate student fellow, and my research is now focused uh, still on neuroplasticity, but now I'm looking at reward circuitry in the brain. And the reason I'm so interested in that is because uh, this reward circuitry of the brain seems to be really involved in the development of substance use disorders. And so we're trying to figure out exactly what kinds of synaptic plasticity may be mediating that and whether there's any way that we can reverse some of the uh, maladaptive learning that occurs in substance use disorders. That's great. And what is the image behind you, Jose, in your background? Uh, yeah, so behind me, um, these uh, images are coming from uh, Jeffrey Littman's lab at Harvard. Um, so I did not take these images. They're really cool. But these are um, essentially the synaptic connections that I'm talking about. So neurons have um, these little uh, micro domains where they connect with another neuron. Um, and uh, essentially, we're, we're really highly zoomed in on those. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Uh, Bethlehem Solomon, I'd like you to introduce yourself now, please. Thank you, Becca. Um, I'd like to start off by saying congrats uh, to those um, the participants here. Well done on um, participating in MSEF this year. There were some excellent projects, so I just wanted to give you guys a shout out. Um, to give you some background on me, I was part of MSEF a while back, um, 2009, 2010, um, when I was a high school student. So I attended Boston Latin Academy. Um, my projects were quite different um, from one another. My first um, project was um, really related to, it was a lot of like immunohistochemistry, um, trying to understand the effects of spinal cord injury on bone loss in the knee. Um, so for those of you who don't have that background, basically it's tissue staining to, to try to figure out what's going on, you know, um, is there cell growth, is there cell death, et cetera. Um, and then my second year, um, I was in a pediatric oncology lab, um, specifically looking at acute myeloid leukemia. Um, and there's um, a unique characteristic that the cell line for um, 
for that uh, condition doesn't uh, function or grow well outside of the body. So we're trying to create a cell line that um, mimics that, that we'd be able to use in the in the lab to you know, create medicines, et cetera. So I did some work on that um, and presented on that in my second year. So very different. And then now I'm in public health, so I'm very far away from that. Um, but when I started my undergrad, um, I started off as a pre-med bio major, um, with the hope of going to medical school, actually uh, wanted wanting to be a pediatrician. Um, so similar to the, the second project that I mentioned, um, but I ended up taking some electives that were um, for the bio major that were more public health and that really um, shifted my interest and then ended up doing some public health internships um, and finally ended um, off on the public health track, did my master's in public health right after at Boston University um, and then went actually to the University of Cambridge in the UK, um, did a fellowship there for about six months, came back to the US um, and went into industry. I was a um, consultant for a um, pharmaceutical company. Um, happy to talk about this further if you guys want a bit later, but we did what we call um, disease forecasting. Um, so I'm an epidemiologist. We studied patterns of disease over time and space. Um, so I did that for a bit um, with that pharmaceutical company as a consultant. And then now I am back in London <laughs> um, at Imperial College London doing my PhD. Um, and the focus of my PhD is actually looking at um, housing quality and health um, and the association. So we know that those housing is very related to our, our health, um, but the, the goal behind the PhD is how do we um, understand that association at the city scale, um, obviously for the purpose of um, creating, developing, and then implementing policies at the city scale. So as I said, happy to talk about these further, but that's a bit about me. Thank you. Great, thank you. And it was actually an email that I received from Beth um, back in January, where she said we want that she wanted to to connect with students, and that was right when we were realizing that we were probably going to have to go virtual for the fair. So we thought, ooh, it'd be great after talking to you, Beth, to be like, there would be great to have an alumni panel. So let's let's put a pin in that and come back to that. Um, so thank you. Um, so Vivek Gopalas Krishnan, can you give a little intro to yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Nice to meet you, everyone. My name is Vivek. I did MSEF back in 2016 and 2017, um, and I7 in 2017. My projects are also same, I think you'll hear from everyone, but very different to what I do now. I was very focused more on microbiology back in the day. Um, my final project that I did in my senior year was a microbiome project. So these are really, really cool. Um, one fun fact you may not know is like two pounds of your body weight is made up of just microbes that symbiotically live with you. Um, and so what I did in 2017 is I got a bunch of my friends together and I made half of them floss and half of them not floss. And then I swabbed their mouths for three months. And I looked at what that did to their oral microbiomes over time. It was really, really great. Um, but one of the problems that you'll have with this kind of data is that like when you get like the actual data back from a sequencing machine is you'll have like this Excel file that's three gigabytes. Um, and actually, so judging the CS project this year, I see like a lot of kids have moved into machine learning and big data. So clearly not a challenge to people at the time now. But back in my day, it was, I had no idea what to do with a data set that big. Um, and so MSEF was the first time that I really got into computational tools. I learned R from scratch to do my MSEF project. Um, and that really made me realize how cool computing could be. The intersection of computation and science was just amazing. And MSEF opened my eyes to that. And so that's what really changed my whole trajectory. I thought I was going to just be um, like a, a wet lab bench top sort of pre-med doctor kind of person. But I went hardcore into computer science. Um, so for my undergrad, I went to Johns Hopkins, studied biomedical engineering, um, and then now this year, I started my PhD at MIT um, in medical engineering and medical physics. And so my research is very much focused on the intersections of machine learning and computer vision with health, um, both in two directions. One, to think about how you can use these tools to treat diseases better, but also how you can use them to understand diseases as well. So both treating and working backwards to understanding diseases at bigger depth. Um, so yeah, that's my focus. Thanks. Great. Um, and Vivek was very um, kind with his time this year as a very busy student, also mentor um, one of the MSF students as well um, through our coaching program. So we thank him for that as well. Um, so we're going to move into some questions. So I'm going to ask some questions of, of all of you and you can all feel free to speak up or just a couple. Um, see how that goes. Um, so my first question is, what is a strong memory that you have of your project participation? Like the work that you did, if there was a moment that you thought, man, this is so awesome that I'm doing this, or a moment that you thought, oh, I really messed that up. 
So does anyone have an example that they can share of, of their, their participation and in, in working on their project? I have one. Um, I remember, um, you know, when we had organized and, and planned out our project um, with my science fair advisor, he had pointed out, you know, like he didn't know the answer or nobody had done the specific reaction that we were planning to run. So he literally didn't know what was going to be the outcome. And so I remember when we ran through and we got our, our product and then we got a sample of it and put it into the infrared spectroscopy machine and we we're going to see like if we got a yield or if we saw the outcome that we were thinking and we got the results and then for a few minutes we were the only people in the world that knew that this happened or that this could exist or that this was like possible and I remember we were like wow like we're the only people in the world that know this right now like that's so cool and we like went and told him and I mean looking back it wasn't like that extraordinary of a reaction it wasn't that surprising but it was really really exciting um to be like the only person the first person to know this um and that's something that i still feel like in my work now like you know i'll run an analysis and i'll i'll be the only person that knows sometimes i'll tell my friends and they'll be like i don't know what any of that is but it's it's exciting to be you know to have that feeling of you know that you figured something out and you you get to share it with people and, and you're the person that knows and you're the person that figured it out that feeling is really satisfying and it doesn't go away that's awesome. I love that the the ownership, and I think that's what's so great about science fair projects too, right? The ownership of you create this, you do this work. It's not what everyone else in your class is doing at the same time. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does anyone else have an example from that? I think um, I I very much had like a well no duh sort of moment um, during my uh, project. Um, so so as I mentioned, I was working with double pendulums. Um, and I was just really interested in sort of how these mechanics of chaos sort of work um, and, and how we could describe them and, and simulate them. Um, and, and this all originated from this, this book that I had read that's that, that said that you couldn't repeat the swing of a double pendulum twice. Um, and so I went and built one, um, but uh, there was kind of this like big dumb moment. So just to like back up a little, so a, a we, we're all familiar with a pendulum, right? It's just like this very predictable system. You lift it up to a certain um, height and it'll swing X amount of times. Um, well, double pendulum is just essentially another pendulum attached to that initial pendulum. Um, and that's enough to make it you know, behave chaotically. Well, it turns out that at very, at, if, you, if you sort of lift this double pendulum like ever so slightly, it's just going to behave like a simple pendulum. And so, I mean, I didn't really go into that thinking that, but at some point I'm like, well, duh, you know? And so I, that kind of opened up like this whole world of, of, of questions, which were, uh, well, at what point will it start behaving chaotically and, and how can we predict what that point will be and, and so forth. But but really uh, kind of like this, well, well, duh moment kind of really just inspired all of these, these next questions that I had. Right. And I love that because it was going through that process that made you realize that, that you knew this and, and you just had to kind of put the pieces together. Great. Anyone else have something else to share on that one? Great. So what I'm going to ask next and feel free to interrupt me, but um, what are some skills or experiences that you did as a student in your projects that you still find yourself doing today? Or what, what were you glad you had experience with as a high school student that you, again, sort of helped jumpstart you? So two, two parts to the same idea. Um, for me, I, and I think this learning to code is, I think it's like, it should be viewed as like a fundamental skill, like learning how to read or how to write. Um, even if like you don't care about like programming like a chessboard or something like that, like a silly programming exercise, learning how to code in like my MSF project opened up a million other opportunities that I wouldn't even know have ex existed if I didn't know how to code. Um, so I think 
when you're in high school, I would really recommend like trying to just find like even basic ways to get yourself into programming because the world of opportunities that open up to you when you know how to code are infinite. There's so much science that like you're limited in terms of like, you just don't have the money to buy like the equipment, like so much of wet lab science like that is prohibitive. Like you have to know someone who can get you into a lab. And if you don't, you're kind of screwed on that front. But knowing how to code is a very democratizing way of doing science. You can find data all over the internet. You can analyze them and ask whatever questions you want. Um, so really, really recommend doing that. Um, and I wouldn't be doing what I didn't do today. What I do today, if it wasn't for learning how to code during MSF. Awesome. I mean, I think for me, sorry. No, go um, ahead. Kind of going um, back to the basics in some senses, um, just like really, cautious, um, thoughtful record keeping, um, you know, writing things down, what you did, how much of what, you know, reagent you use, all of those details matter. Um, and I've seen kind of throughout my career time and time again, how important those things are. Even I remember um, that first project that we did um, that I was a part of for MSEF um, later on got published. And um, my advisor at the time came back to me and said, you know, can we go back to your notes and see um, the, you know, the methods that you use for this part. And I was very thankful that I had, I mean, at that time was very meticulous about what I wrote. Um, and it ended up being in as part of the methods for the paper. Um, but it's so, so important. I mean, we all know the importance of like re reproducibility um, and repeating um, trials and things like that in science. Um, but I think MSEF really did help. I mean, you guys have seen um, all of the log books and things that you've uploaded, but that's such an important skill. I think no matter what you do um, in science, I mean, even with coding, right? Um, you know, what, which um, packages you used, you know, um, keeping the codes, what you change from, um, you know, one version of your analysis to another, that's so, so important. So I think um, that's one of the, I think, very important skills that I, that I was able to, to really build on um, during my MSEF uh, experience as well. Great. Anything else on that in terms of skills? No, okay. Um, so what about when you think about, so when we think about the fair, right? There's the project that you've worked on and then there's the fair event, which is very fresh in, in everyone's mind right now. Um, what do you think when you think back to that experience of actually what it was like for you to present at the fair, um, sort of in relation to the full scope of the work that you did? For me, I think, the, uh, you know, going to the fair was um, really, it was very validating to, you know, present the project to people who we didn't know before, um, to other students from other schools who just kind of walked by and started asking questions. And then of course to the judges. Um, and so that was sort of like, you know, it felt good to get this kind of like external reinforcement that our project was good. Um, and to be able to talk about it to other people who would be interested in it. Um, and so that, that was sort of my main, my main um, memory of the fair itself, you know, is that we were, we were at MIT and like we were, you know, it was like really exciting to get to sort of like show and get recognition for the, the, the months of work that we had put into this project. Um, so that's sort of my main, my main memory of that. Yeah, that's great. Anyone else had that, how that experience, uh, what they sort of remember from that experience and what it meant to them? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think, think uh, go ahead. Okay, sure. I think it's just, it's great that you guys get so many experts who can come and talk to us. Like you, when you work on this project in your high school, like you can talk to your teachers or your parents, but like they are not the world's leading expert in what you're like trying to get into. But then suddenly like the world's leading expert will show up and be a judge. Um, and they'll tell you things that you did right and things that you did absolutely wrong. And it's really, really helpful to have that kind of high level feedback, especially in high school. Great. And Beth? Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to highlight Ethan's point. Um, I think get, getting that visibility was big for me as well. Um, you know, just that my project is is outside that lab that I'm working in or outside that space that I'm working in and it's relevant and people are interested you know all of these things um, I thought for me especially as a high school student was 
was actually very overwhelming in some senses. Um, and that in retrospect, I think also, um, you know, going through that scientific process. Um, so, you know, when you, for instance, when you're publishing a paper, there's always a peer review, right? Um, so having people who are outside of your kind of circle that you're working in, they will come and critique your work. You know, they'll say, this is good. Um, you know, they'll ask you questions. Um, even if you're the expert in the field, you still you still go through that review process. Um, and I think being able to get a sneak peek into that um, is, is really, really valuable. Great. Um, I think one of the questions too is around, um, as you sort of, you know, you all talked about how your, your field sort of evolved, obviously, and your interest in high school led to other things, but I don't think any of you are really doing the same work that you were, were so focused on in high school, if I'm thinking through quickly. Um, so where do you feel like there were those sort of pivot points or those, those points where things changed for you? And some of you already addressed that in your, your introduction, but what led you you know, Ethan, in terms of looking at the veterans work and then and going into then sex chromosomes and now going into aging, like what what causes some of those changes and shifts for you? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the 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 shift from doing like organic chemistry projects in high school versus psychology projects in college and after, I think had a lot to do with sort of like uh, the the mentors that I had, you know, when I was in college, I was lucky to have, um, you know, to know of a professor at a local college who was in, in chemistry. And so he could help with the project, even though I wasn't necessarily gonna be a chemist uh, or, or had that desire. Um, and I think sort of, um, you know, moving within psychology from one area to another, it's kind of been guided by the more I learn, um, or the more that I conduct research in this, the more I learn about stuff that I didn't know existed before, or I learn about problems that I didn't realize before, you know? So studying um, veterans with PTSD, you know, I learned a lot about, um, you know, how we can use the brain to try and study or make guesses about um, how things might look in the real world in behavior, but also about how how many problems there are with that and how we still have a lot to learn and how genetics is a big part of that. Um, and that's sort of what led me to studying sex chromosomes. Um, and then um, over time learning about how we need to collect data over time because that's you know really gonna be one of the only feasible ways that we can make real strong statements about how the brain is related to behavior uh, in, in, in people. Um, and so I think sort of you just as you go, you learn more stuff and then you realize, oh, there's this problem that I didn't know about two years ago last year, but it's interesting and I'm young in my career so I can switch and I can study that, um, you know, that option is available, I think for like until you're pretty far in your career it's it's pretty possible to sort of switch gears and go um, in another another direction. Great. Yeah, and I think that the idea too is, and what you've all emphasized is you don't need to know right now what you want to do in five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road. And it's a, it's an evolution, right? Um, I want to go to, there are a couple of questions um, that have popped up. Um, Derek asked about gaining access to lab equipment. Um, and I know some of you have answered this piece as well um, in terms of building connections and knowing people. Um, but I guess one question I have um, for all of you is what did you feel worked for you in terms of presenting yourself to a connect, like a connection or a lab or someone who's willing to work with you? Um, and again, I just want to also say like not all projects need to happen in a lab with fancy equipment, but for those students who are interested in that, like what is the best way as a high school student that you present yourself? What are the professional qualities that you feel like a lab person is looking for in a student to sort of be willing to take that on and take that mentorship risk on. And I didn't prep you for this question, so. <laughs> um, I mean, as I mentioned in the chat, I think that um, especially at the high school level, um, one of your best resources are your teachers um, and although they may not be working in your field of interest or anything like that, um, 
they may have connections at, at the colleges that they attended, or if you poke them, maybe they can investigate to see if, you know, if they might know anybody who works in that um, area of interest that, that might be able to help you. Um, and also, I guess, poking your, your school around to see if there's any funds that could go towards um, your, your science fair project as well. Um, that's, that's, that's the route that I went. Um, I didn't really know anybody who had gone to college or anything like that. I, I wasn't lucky enough to have any connections of that sort. But um, thankfully, um, my teachers were able to connect me to people once I started asking around. Thanks. Anything else on that one before we go to another question? Um, I wanted to add um, curiosity. Um, and just, I think that's what science is all about, um, right? Being curious, asking questions, um, showing interest, reading up on something before you talk to someone about it. Um, all of these things are really, really relevant and they and they show um, when we speak to, you know, people who are in labs. Um, so I, fortunately um, was uh, a part of two different labs when I was um, as a high school student. Um, but I'll say the first, very first lab that I worked in, um, they, so actually they had a summer program for students and that's also something that's available. I mean, I grew up in the Boston area, went to high school in the Boston area and there's lots of programs in Boston um, for sure. I'm not as familiar with the other cities in Massachusetts, um, but I applied to the program um, straight right after my freshman year of high school. Um, so I was very, very young, but I was very adamant about finding a job, um, a summer job that was going to direct me in some way. Um, and that's that's what I said in my interview. Um, and I ended up getting the job, but I remember um, the woman that was um, interviewing me saying, we've never hired anyone this young, um, but you know, we're going to take you on board. And I think it was just this sense of curiosity, this sense of like passion and saying, you know, this is what I'm really interested in um, and I'm going to pursue it. And, and those, I mean, showing that, right. Um, don't feel like you have to, you know, um, kind of contain that or, or, you know, for whatever reason, um, show them that you're interested, show them that you're curious, show them that the work that you've put in um, to get to that point and, and why you're interested in these things. Um, and that really um, attracts, you know, um, people to, to draw you in, um, they wanna take you on board. Um, so I think curiosity is a really, really important factor um, for, for showing your interest in labs and, and put yourself out there. It doesn't hurt. What's the worst that can happen, right? They say no and you, you go to the next lab and I've been told no plenty of times. So don't, <laughs> don't, um, don't feel like that that's um, the end of the world. Right, right. Cause you also wanna find the right fit too, right? You wanna, you wanna work with people who wanna work with you and that's what's important. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so let's see, Ishita um, asked about how you can go about publishing research you conducted to your MSEF projects. Um, I don't know if any of you have experience with that. Um, I do know personally that you can also look into the Journal for Emerging Investigators, JEI, I think it's, that's, a, that's one, one possibility. Do, you, do either of you, do any of you have other experience with that? Yeah, I never actually published any of my stuff from MSEF, um, but, like when doing it in undergrad, one of the things I never knew, it's free to submit your work to journals. Like it's, there's, there's no, there, there shouldn't be like, if you're submitting to like a good journal, there should be no upfront cost just submitting your work. So honestly, like, I feel like people should just like, it should be more encouraged. Like you don't even have to go to like a journal for high schoolers. Like if you feel good about your work and you know that there's like a good venue that's in line with it, just put together your report, write a cover letter, send it and see what happens. Um, I think maybe even editors, like the worst they can do is just say, we're not going to accept it. But I think also if they got like something from a high schooler, I think a lot of people are very encouraging of young students and they would say, this might not be the right place, but we can recommend that you send it over here instead. So really just send it out. Great. Thank you. Beth, did you have something on that too? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, when I was in high school student, I was not thinking about publishing work. So again, the mm -hmm. fact that you guys are even like aware and, and you know, um, very impressive. Um, yeah, I think also telling the people that you're working with on that project that you're interested in publishing, even from the very beginning is good because you can set your project up in a way um, and everything that you do for the project in a way that 
you know, makes it easier for you to get on that publishing track. So I think just being upfront at the very beginning, say, you know, I'm very interested in this project. And if there's the potential to publish, I'd be very interested in pursuing that as well. And just saying that from the very beginning, I think really helps um, with just setting up and organizing the project and, and thinking about it as well. Um, and then I'm just going to point out there's a question in you, for you specifically, Beth, in the Q&A, so you can take a look at that and answer that. Um, so one other question um, from Nevin is, would you say that you've maintained the relationships and connections that you made through Science Fair um, into your professional work? And if so, has this benefited you after? Any I would say absolutely. Um... So I still talk to many of these teachers to this day, um, which I guess is more of like a fun thing now just to go out for lunch and, and catch up. Um, but uh, through these teachers, as I had mentioned, I was actually able to connect with some physics professors at Tufts, um, who I now have the pleasure of being able to nerd out with every once in a while. So even though I didn't pursue physics, I, I get to go back and talk to them and, and entertain some of the thoughts I have uh, within physics. Um, and for a while, immediately after the um, science fair, um, I was actually offered to work in one of these labs. Um, I, I ended up not going with that because I, I, I found some other opportunities. But definitely, if you, if you do make these connections, you know, reach out to them, give them updates on what you've been up to. Um, and really, it's important to show gratitude also, because you know, really, a lot of times that they're just doing this out of the goodness of their heart, they're not being compensated for it. Um, so I think it's really important to, you know, thank them and, and sort of show them what doors they ended up uh, opening for you. That's a great answer. Any other ones on that one? Great. Awesome. Well, we're going to want to wrap up. So I'm just going to ask um, one question to put you all on the spot too. Is there something that you like to do outside of your professional and academic interests so that you're not just the science person that you are? What else defines you? <laughs> and you can say nothing. This is all I ever do. But <laughs> I write poetry um, during my free time. Um, so I'm really into spoken word poetry specifically. Um, that, that's just a lot of fun. Um, and it's also a good outlet for energy. I also feel like um, spoken word poetry has helped me with, um, with uh, like presentation skills and being yeah. comfortable with the mic and an audience and so forth. So there's um, some uh, uh, benefits uh, for my science from, from my hobby, I guess. Yeah, that's great. Any other skills and talents? <laughs> Vivek, you're, you're shaking your head. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I, I, I sing and I play guitar and uh, I like writing music. That works. Anything else? Uh, Ethan, I've also played. Um, music, you know, from high school and continued throughout college and, and continue to now. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just like, it's just a good thing to keep up and it's fun to do like low stakes playing with your friends, something like that. That's great. Well, they are all very talented. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm more of a sports person, so I enjoy playing sports, um, volleyball, soccer, things like that. Yeah. Great. Great. Um, well, we will wrap up now. Um, just again, a reminder for everyone. Um, the next sessions will start um, right at 11 o'clock. Um, and so there's two sessions at each time. Um, so if you go to the agenda, you're going to go in the same place to the auditorium and you click on that link and then you just choose which session you want to go to. Um, all of the sessions will be recorded um, and the platform will be open um, for a few weeks after this. So you'll be, be able to come back um, and view those. Um, but we really appreciate your participation um, and the four of you, thank you so much for the time um, to think about what you wanted to share today and to talk with us. We really appreciate it. So thank you. Any final words? No, perfect. <laughs> all has been said. Great, then we will see you all later um, and thank you. <laughs>